Shabbat Shalom. Well, we're back again for another Black History Month presentation. I had originally planned it to do it on a separate subject, but uh, a couple of Shabbats ago, as the choir was singing and, and praising, the spirit came to me and told me, no, you're going to change the subject. This is what I want you to do. So anyway, my subject today will be on African Americans in defense of the nation from 1776 to 2022. Uh, you will allow me some to digress at points because there's some interesting parts in American history that I think you ought to know. Uh, I want to give full credit to Adonai for letting me get up here and thank you for Rabbi John and Rabbi Richard for letting me speak this message to you today. I want to give credit to my dear wife Amelia who was instrumental in getting this presentation together. Any mistakes or omissions are entirely my own. <laughs> I would also like to uh, Honor my late brother Robert, uh, he and I did a book a number of years ago uh, on uh, Black Faces of War. It was published by Zenith Press and a lot of the photographs that uh, you will see will come from that. He died four years ago Monday on Valentine's Day. Uh, unfortunately, he, uh, um, I, it's, so, it's so important to take care of your health, that's all I'm gonna say. And so many of us men in particular you get 40, 50, you're not 20 anymore. You have to change your diet and change the way you live if you want to see some years. So I, I credit Adonai, the kosher diet. Uh, you give up that pork, and now I'm from Iowa, where there are more pigs from, than people. And I eat on that hog for you know, 25, 30 years. So I just, I want to give credit to Adonai for weaning me off that. <laughs> so, so, thank you. In any event, um, there's a wealth of history in America and around the world for today's presentation. As I say, I'm going to focus on black soldiers in America's history. The last man I'm going to mention is the inspiration for this story because he is our most recent Medal of Honor winner. We haven't had a black Medal of Honor winner since the Vietnam War. But we'll get to this man. He was a sergeant first class in the 3rd Infantry Division, United States Army. So we'll get to that at the end. But I want to start at the beginning. Here's my clicker. I hope I can get this right for you. Uh, Lord, let's see, which way? Huh? Which, okay. The right one? Left button? Uh, you're going to have to give me some help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good start. Holy are you, Lord. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. So uh, you will see that, uh, uh, well, let's see now. Well, I think it's been right there in that box. All right, okay. There we go. It's kind of a panoply of the faces of black men and women that have served this country since colonial times. The first man to die for this nation in 1770 was Crispus Attucks. That's the man second from right in the Boston Massacre. See General Powell up there and so many other great figures, men and women who have you will see that uh, it is not political progress per se. Uh, the civil rights movement, the backbone of the civil rights movement was the men and women in uniform that came out of the military and had seen the elephant. And they're the ones who, who were the backbone of the NAACP, the abolitionist movement, and so many other uh, uh, human rights movements in this country. Military service and sacrifice have been the driving forces for freedom and equality for African Americans. As I said, it was the service of veterans that formed the backbone of the abolitionist and civil rights movements from colonial times to the present day. The anti-slavery or abolitionist movement did not begin a few years before the Civil War. Rather, its roots go back to the American Revolution with England. You can see from the very beginning of this nation, African Americans have been on the front lines in defense of freedom and liberty. When the idea of America as a new nation was still just a dream for the colonial founders and settlers, people of color were working right alongside the Founding Fathers. And sometimes some of our black women were with the Founding Fathers, but we'll, we'll, that, we'll, 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 we'll visit that later. This chart shows us that black soldiers have fought and died in every war in our nation from the Revolutionary War to the Persian Gulf. That list you will see how many served, and look at the, number, the Medals of Honor to the right. The Medal of Honor was not given until the Civil War. You can see the numbers, 5,000 in the Revolution, 1,500 in the War of 1812, 214,000 in the Civil War, 5,000 in the Indian Wars, 1,500 in the Spanish-American War, 380,000 in World War I, 1 1.3 black uh, million, 1.3 million black men and women in the World War II, 600,000 in the Korean War, 
and 3,300,000 in the Vietnam War. I was unable to get a final count for uh, Persian Gulf, Iraq, and Afghanistan, but these figures are from the uh, United States Department of Defense. 5,000 black men fought in the American Revolutionary War from 70, 1776 to 1782. Uh, for the Continental Army, for independence from England, these brave men, free and slave, felt that a war for liberty would lead to freedom for black slaves and equality for all men. While these soldiers would not live to see this dream realized, many colonial settlers, black and white, strongly believed that slavery was inconsistent with the, eyes of independence from, the idea of independence from England and liberty for all men and women. As I said, Crispus Attucks died in the Boston Massacre on March 5th, 1770. This was the exchange that started the Revolutionary War. Uh, President, or then General George Washington was initially resistant to the idea of arming black slaves. The manpower needs of both the colonies and England, however, resulted in policies that promised freedom to slaves and bounties and land to free blacks who volunteered for military service. England also opened its doors that any escaped slave would receive protection from the British Crown, and about 15 to 20,000 slaves escaped from the South and took shelter in the British lines. Uh, also in those days, uh, a white man could send a slave in his place to military service, so compensation was to be paid by state governments to Southern slave owners. Uh, you might not know that Benjamin Franklin, who was originally a slaveholder himself, later served as president of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery and the relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in bondage. This group solicited funds to extend relief to free men, secure their employment, and provide schooling for their children. In 1787, the New York Manumission Society opened its first African free school with 40 students in attendance. American patriots against slavery included John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, the Marquis de Lafayette, Benjamin Rush, Noah Webster, Luther Martin, and Anthony Benizet, who was a Quaker leader. Uh, colonial black leaders included, included Phyllis Wheatley, the famous poet, Prince Hall, the founder of black masonry, and Benjamin Banneker, the famous mathematician and surveyor. All of them petitioned um, colonial legislatures for what they call manumission laws to free the slaves in their jurisdictions. A little bit about Benjamin Banneker. He built the first clock in America. He is one of the first African Americans to uh, gain distinction in science. He built this clock entirely out of wood it was believed to be the first clock built in America. It kept precise time for decades. In 1789, Banneker began making astronomical calculations that enabled him to successfully forecast a solar eclipse, and he was also instrumental in surveying what later became the city of Washington, D.C. Many black men distinguished themselves in battles during the Revolutionary War. Jack Sisson, Paul Cuff, Peter Salem, Pompey, and Salem Poor were just a few of them. Colonel Christopher Green, a white man, commanded the all-black 1st Regiment of Rhode Island Militia, which bravely held colonial positions against three heavy charges of British and Hessian troops over a period of four hours, inflicting over 200 casualties on the enemy. There's an interesting tidbit for you. There was a woman of mixed color, a, a free black woman of mixed race, masqueraded as a man, enlisted in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment on May 20th, 1782. Her name was Deborah Sampson Gannett, uh, and she came in using the name of Robert Shirtliff. Uh, she served for almost 18 months in combat as a regular soldier before her masquerade was detected. Ten years later, she was awarded 34 pounds, that's British pounds sterling, for her extraordinary instance of female heroism by the Massachusetts State Assembly. Unfortunately, after the war, most black servicemen did not receive their freedom or equality. Some did receive their bounties, some did receive land but most of them did not. And some did receive freedom. As I say, uh, the free black classes of uh, Philadelphia and Washington, uh, New York and other cities came from a lot of these men uh, who had received their freedom after the Revolutionary War. Nevertheless, uh, this is blank, I gotta read it to you, that's my mistake. Uh, the Constitution still read that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Several colonial states that banned slavery were Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. They all banned slavery within their borders or put in place laws that eventually ended that peculiar institution. 
Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that sharply restricted slavery's westward expansion of the South, unfortunately, would continue to hold millions of slaves until April 1865. In the War of 1812, despite the valor of black soldiers and sailors in the Revolution, Congress passed a law in 1792 limiting enrollment in the militia to white citizens only. The Continental Navy of America ignored these restrictions and immediately sought black volunteers for service in frigates and privateer raiding ships. Incapable of matching the size and scope of the Royal Navy, America succeeded in fast-moving ship-to-ship battles. One such exchange between a smaller but faster American privateer, the Governor Tompkins, and a much larger British frigate, two black sailors sold such, uh, just demonstrated such bravery that the ship's captain, Nathaniel Shaler, later wrote, before I could get our light sails in and almost before I could turn around, I was under the gun, not of a transport, but of a frigate, and not more than a quarter mile from me. I immediately commenced a brisk fire from our little battery, but this returned with woeful interest. Her first broadside killed two men and wounded six others. The name of one of my poor fellows who was killed ought to be registered in the Book of Fame and remembered with reverence as long as bravery is considered a virtue. He was a black man by the name of John Johnson. A 24-pound shot struck him in the hip and tore away all the lower parts of his body. In this state, the poor fellow lay on the deck and several times exclaimed to his shipmates, fire away, my boys, no haul the color down. Interesting, interestingly, 16, 60 years later, in 1872, a black sailor named John Johnson won the Medal of Honor for bravery aboard the USS Kansas. The Battle of New Orleans and the War of 1812. General Andrew Jackson was a surprising advocate for utilizing free blacks in the defense of New Orleans, the largest and most important seaport of the young United States. The British sought control of the southern sea trade in the Mississippi River. Free men of color had been recruited by the Spanish and organized into two large battalions, and we will meet these men later in the Civil War. The first and second regiments of the Louisiana Native Guard entrusted with maintaining law and order in the streets of the brawling seaport. These mostly biracial men uh, were later contracted by the French to fight local Indian tribes. The governor of Louisiana was such a strong supporter of the black soldiers, and he even called on them to suppress a serious slave rebellion in 1811 in the parish of St. John the Baptist. I tell you, American history gets weird the more you read it. <laughs> in the Battle of New Orleans on December 23rd, 1812, some 6,000 free black men, slaves, Creoles, black and white men from Santo Domingo and Choctaw Indians repulsed a much larger British army led by General Pakenham, who was killed by a free black rifleman. Ironically, the Treaty of Gent was signed prior to the Battle of New Orleans, but the news traveled so slowly that uh, the end of the 1812 war was not known for several weeks. Over 2,000 British soldiers died in the battle for New Orleans. Now, I want to give you a little update on this. Andrew Jackson was no friend of people of color. He had promised freedom to escape slaves who fought for him, but after the war, he returned them to the masters in slavery. Free black men who counted on bounties and land got neither. The Choctaw wanted uh, guarantees of tribal land rights. They didn't get that either. When Andrew Jackson became president, he was the one that, that uh, instrumented the Trail of Tears when the five civilized tribes were removed from Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana and taken to Indian Territory, which is now uh, Oklahoma. Over a quarter of the Indians died on the march. They lost millions and millions of choice acres of land. So Andrew Jackson, he used people to get his way, and then they were no longer convenient. He kicked them to the curb. But that's American history. They say they're gonna take him off the $20 bill and put Sojourner Truth on there. I hope they do. 214,000 black men fought in the Civil War from 1861 to 1865 uh, in both the Union Army and the Navy. Uh, the, the war began April 12, 1862 when South Carolina, excuse me, 1861 when South Carolina seceded from the Union and began firing on Fort Sumter. At the beginning of the war, the Union Army rejected black soldiers be believing that the war would be of short duration. The massive Union casualties of the Battle of Shiloh in 1862 forced President Abraham Lincoln to begin accepting black soldiers in the Union military service. 178,975 black men served in the Grand Army of the Republic and 9,695 in the Union Navy. Excuse the picture, it was a nice shot of a black soldier, but it just didn't come out here. It was a little daguerreotype, but anyway. Uh, they comprised 135 infantry, infantry regiments, six cavalry regiments, 12 heavy artillery regiments, and 10 batteries of light artillery. The 
They, they, they fought in 39 major battles, 410 minor actions, with 2,752 men killed. Now those deaths on the right, 65,271, that's from wounds and disease. So out of that number, uh, over 65,000 men died of disease. I want to give you a little backup on this too. Um, as far as the Civil War is concerned, we will visit with uh, some leaders of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments of Louisiana Native Guard. Uh, I mentioned them before in the, in the, as far as the Battle of New Orleans, but I want to mention this thing as a letter from Abraham Lincoln to a black mother. Now this isn't going to come up, I'm going to have to read it to you, so you, that's my mistake. There was a mother, a black woman in Iowa, sent seven sons of the Union Army and all of them were killed in action. Now you remember that movie Saving Private Ryan? When the actor that played General George Marshall read that letter? Uh, uh, let me see. May you be comforted by the Almighty for laying such a dear sacrifice on the altar of liberty. This black woman sent seven sons. They were listed all as mulattoes, and in that language of the day, that means they're mixed race, half black, half white. She sent seven of them to the Union service, and all of them were killed in action. Now, you see this man on the right. This is Major Francis Dumas, 1st Regiment, uh, Louisiana Native Guard. The white man on the left is Colonel Nathan W. Daniels, his commander. Now, black officers in the Union Army included leaders of the 1st, 2nd, 3rd Regiments of Louisiana Native Guards, uh, Francis Dumas, who you see here, Captains Andre Caillou, and PBS Pinchback. Now, Captain Pinchback, after the war, became the first black governor and the first Republican governor of the state of Louisiana. This man, remember I told you about the four to 6,000 black slave owners in the South before 1860? He was one of them. His father was white and his mother was mixed French Creole and black. He was sent to England for his education he could speak five foreign languages. His father uh, willed him a sugar plantation outside New Orleans and 150 slaves. His net worth in 1860 was a quarter million dollars. Back then, that was a huge amount of money. Now, since the, the uh, Louisiana Guards volunteered for Confederate service, they were refused. So they turned around and fought for the Union. Dumas freed all his slaves and his male slaves formed the third regiment of the Louisiana Native Guards that fought in the Civil War. So, I'm telling you, then uh, I could, there are about six other, I think Kailu was one too, uh, had white fathers and black mothers. They inherited plantations and slaves. These were wealthy men. And uh, they were educated in Europe because in those days, most colleges would not admit blacks, north or south. I'm gonna give you another interesting story uh, for our African brothers and sisters. Here are black officers in the Union Army, uh, Major Martin Delaney, uh, Second Lieutenant Stephen Swales, Captain William Appleton won the, the first black officer to win the Medal of Honor in 1864. There's Peter Vogel's gang and uh, Staff Surgeon Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Augusta. Now, you see this man on the left, Martin R. Delaney. He was the first black graduate of Harvard Medical School. His, let me get this straight, his father was a black slave, but his mother was an African princess from the Mandinka tribe of West Africa. Her father's name was Shango. He was a prince. Because she was free, even though his father was a slave, the laws of the United States at that time, slave status was determined by the mother. So even if you were free, if the father was white, black, Native American, whatever, if the mother was a slave, the child was a slave. That's how the system was maintained. Thomas Jefferson, half of his slaves were his own children. He was having sex with Sally Hemings and a, quite a few other black women on his plantation. So like I say, half his slaves were his own children. It was a, a godless system, but that's the way it was in those days. But Martin R. Delaney uh, maintained his, his uh, roots in Africa. He had traveled extensively to Liberia and was setting up a nation called Free Black Israel because he wanted the freed slaves to come to Africa. He spoke a couple of African dialects and he was in Liberia when the war started and he came back to serve in the Union Army. So that's him in his uniform and sword on the left. Remarkable human being, remarkable. There's some more of our Union officers, Medal of Honor winners. Um, 16 black soldiers won the Medal of Honor for bravery. Eight black sailors were so decorated. There's some more of them. We'll go to the Indian Wars. The Buffalo Soldiers of the 9th and 10th Cavalry, 24th and 25th Infantry. For the first time in American history, black soldiers were allowed to serve in the peacetime U.S. Army. Um, four regiments, two of cavalry and two of infantry. These regiments, known collectively as the Buffalo Soldiers, were among the U.S. Army's finest units. 
They had uh, record rates of reenlistment and low rates for desertion and drunkenness on duty. Despite overt racism from the War Department, the U.S. Army itself, uh, white civilians and whites in the military, they, they uh, fought bravely to help defeat the Kiowa, Comanche, Ute, Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Apache, and Kickapoo nations. On December 26, 1867, 60 black soldiers of Troop K, 9th Cavalry repulsed attacks from over 1,200 Kickapoo warriors at Fort Lancaster in West Texas. They inflicted heavy casualties on the Kickapoos. There we go. Now, there's another interesting tidbit for you. This is Kathy Williams, a black woman who masqueraded as a man and fought the 24th United States Infantry during the Indian Wars. Um, she enlisted as a man uh, under the name of William Cathy. She just reversed her name. Her masquerade lasted for almost a year before her true identity was discovered during a medical examination following repeated physical injuries, smallpox, and diabetes. She went on to marry and start her own business after her discharge from military service, later divorcing her husband who stole one of her wagons and two of her horses. <laughs> she worked hard, but she died early in her 50s in uh, 1893. It's fascinating, she was a very large woman. She was five foot eight and 145 pounds, which in those days was extremely large for a woman. She was larger than some of her male uh, line mates. But was a, I, I, I had two pictures of her, but I couldn't pull them down. They're both black and white photographs of her later in life, but I couldn't uh, pull them down off the internet, so I, I used that painting there. Here are some of our 18 Medal of Honor winners for the Buffalo Soldiers in the Indian Wars. Uh, you see that Thomas Shaw, that's another one of these octoroons or quadroons, men who were, you know, uh, one quarter or one eighth black and the rest white, but they, they were still classified as black, the peculiar racial classifications of the day. These are our black officers in the Indian Wars, two of the three. Uh, first Lieutenant Henry Ossian Flipper on your left, the first black graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, served in the 10th Cavalry. First Lieutenant John Alexander was the second black graduate, served in the 9th. The man on the right is First Lieutenant, later Lieutenant Colonel Charles Young, the third black West Point graduate, led the 10th Cavalry during the punitive expedition to Mexico in 1916 under the overall command of General John J. Blackjack Pershing. Now, he was supposed to be our first black general in command of the 92nd Division in France in World War I. The Army forcibly retired him, unfortunately, much to his uh, objection. There were 1,500 soldiers, black soldiers, in the Spanish-American War, fought bravely in Cuba and the Philippines, including the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and 25th Infantry, and several all-black state National Guard regiments. That's what these men here are. These are one of these all-black state volunteer uh, National Guard units. Black soldiers led the charge up San Juan Hill, along with white soldiers from the 3rd Infantry Regiment. Sergeant George Berry of the 10th Cavalry planted the flags of both units on Kettle Hill, that's San Juan Hill. Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders, Rough Riders ran up the hill at the end of the battle. Six black soldiers won the Medal of Honor. There are two of them, uh, Sergeant Major Edward Baker, Jr., who was later promoted second lieutenant. The man on the right saved the USS Iowa battleship from exploding. Uh, he risked his life jumping across steaming boilers uh, to, to remove uh, coal from the uh, engines before the engines overheated and blew up. So he won the Medal of Honor for that. Uh, World War I, the war to end all wars. American entry into the Great War began in 1917. By war's end, over 400,000 black men volunteered for Army service, including 1,250 black U.S. Army officers trained at the 17th Provisional Training Regiment at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. 639 of those men actually received commissions and helped command the all-black 92nd and 93rd Rainbow Divisions in combat against the Germans. Now, that man second from right, that's uh, First Lieutenant A.R. Fisher from Indiana. You'll notice he won the Distinguished Service Cross. That was the highest medal given at that time to any black soldier, even though there were, there, there were numerous uh, accounts of black bravery in the war. The War Department would not decorate black soldiers for bravery. My grandfather was wounded three times in combat. They wouldn't even give him a Purple Heart. He was a second lieutenant. Uh, by armistice on November 11th, over 300 black American soldiers had been decorated by the French Army for bravery. Um, as most of the black American soldiers had been assigned to the French, serving alongside colonial Moroccan and Senegalese regiments. At home, African Americans were subjected to overt racial violence during the bloody red summer of 1917. White lynch mobs terrorized black neighborhoods north and south, fueling the rise of the 20th century Ku Klux Klan. I want to read as a little news a blurb about this, uh, what they call the silent Negro protest 
where 100,000 uh, blacks marched silently down the streets of, war of uh, New York City to protest racist treatment. I'm going to tell you about one of these. There are about 28 of these. Really, they're pogroms, if you want to think of pogroms against black people in America. East St. Louis, Illinois race riot, July 1st and 3rd, 1917, after weeks of tension and attacks on blacks spurred by the use of black workers to replace striking white workers in a plant processing bauxite for the war effort, a white mob set fire to the black section of the city and destroyed it. Black residents were brutally attacked and shot as they tried to flee the fires. The National Guard, called in by the mayor, uh, proved ineffective against the, the mob violence. At least 39 African Americans were killed and hundreds more were burned and beaten. The Lady Macbeth of East St. Louis, which is kind of a, a white uh, supremacist group, the, uh, uh, let me see, the Cleveland Advocate newspaper wrote, white women yelled encouragement to the white mob and some participate in the beatings of black men and women. The Cleveland Advocate reported that women and children pursued the black women who were driven out of their building or out of their homes with the idea not of extinguishing their burning clothing but of inflicting added pain if possible. They stood around in groups laughing and jeering while they witnessed the final writhings of the terror of the pain uh, of their racked wretches who crawled into the streets to die after their flesh had been cooked in their own homes. There were also riots in Memphis and Waco right up the street here in Waco, Texas. A 22-year-old black man named, I believe it was Jesse Washington, yes, was sadistically tortured and murdered. But this is what was going on while our black soldiers were fighting overseas. You can understand the constant tension that was going on then. Corporal Freddie Stowers won the Medal of Honor posthumously in 1991, um, 73 years after his service in the 371st Infantry Regiment, 93rd Division. He was the only black soldier at that time that won the Medal of Honor. Since then, President Barack Obama awarded posthumous Medals of Honor to Private Later Sergeant Henry Johnson, immortalized in a battle that bore his name on the early morning of May 14, 1918, near Barbac, France. Now, Understand that a lot of white people thought that black soldiers were cowards and would run at the first, excuse me, at the first attack of the enemy. Surprised at the assault by an estimated 24 German soldiers, Johnson and his comrade, Private Needham Roberts, were wounded by hand grenades thrown by the Bosch. Johnson responded with three deadly shots from his French 8mm LaBelle rifle. At point blank range, wounded by grenade shrapnel, German bullets and bayonets, Johnson attacked with his bolo knife. A bolo knife is like a, like a Texas bowie knife, but it's got a hand guard, like a, a sword on it. Anyway, um, he killed three more enemy soldiers with his knife, wounded six. The German patrol fled. Johnson chased the fleeing Bosch for 50 yards until he collapsed from loss of blood and 26 bullet trapped on bayonet wounds. He lived. Denied any commendation by the American Expeditionary Force, he and Private Roberts were the first Americans to receive France's highest award for combat bravery. The Croix de Guerre was star and palm. Surprised at the, uh, excuse me, so these there's a Sergeant Henry Johnson there. Unfortunately, he died in the 1920s, an alcoholic, homeless. Nobody would help him with his post-traumatic stress. Uh, it wasn't until, I think, 1929 that the government finally established the Veterans Administration specifically to deal with uh, injured World War I veterans. 1.3 million blacks served in World War II. On December, Sunday, December 7th, 1941, the Naval and Air Forces of Imperial Japan launched a surprise attack on the U.S. battleship fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Japanese torpedoes and bombs tore into the unprepared ship, sinking the USS Arizona, the USS West Virginia, and USS Tennessee, badly damaging many other vessels and killing over 3,000 Americans. Black sailors, most of them mess men, cooks, and waiters, leaped into action to defend their ships, manning anti-aircraft guns and wounding com uh, rescuing wounded comrades. Dory Miller, a mess attendant from Waco, Texas, manned a 20 millimeter cannon on the USS West Virginia, shooting down, depending upon who you talk to, between two and six Japanese bombers, later winning the Navy Cross for bravery. Other black sailors who won the Navy Cross were Leonard Ray Harmon on the USS San Francisco and William Pinckney aboard the USS Enterprise. Albert, Albert H. Oliver won the Silver Star on the USS Intrepid. Most of the black soldiers in, U in World War II served in support roles. The 761st and 758th Tank Battalions served with distinction in France and Italy. I talked a little bit about to, you in, by, to them in my last presentation. The 92nd Division, which started out with 15,000 men, suffered 5,000 casualties during the Italian campaign in World War II. 
The 332nd Fighter Squadron, the, leg the legendary Tuskegee Airmen, earned numerous distinguished flying crosses, escorting B-17 and B-24 bombers over North Africa, Italy, France, and Germany. There's some more Tuskegee Airmen. No medals of honor were awarded to black soldiers in World War II until President Bill Clinton upgraded a number of men who had won the Distinguished Service Cross to Medal of Honor status. Uh, let me see. First Lieutenant Vernon Baker uh, from Clarinda, Iowa, was the only surviving man. That's him that left uh, there shaking President Clinton's hand. The other Medal of Honor winners were Staff Sergeant Edward Carter, Lieutenant John Fox, First Lieutenant Charles Thomas, Staff Sergeant Reuben Rivers, PFC Willie James Jr., and PFC George Watson. A little bit about Baker, so I had a, the privilege of interviewing him for a, a chapter I, I contributed to a book on black uh, soldiers from Iowa. Uh, he was second in command of an infantry, infantry platoon at Castle Agonolfi in Italy. Um, uh, his, on April 5th, 1945, he was abandoned by his white commander, Captain John Runyon, who ran off with a radio man saying he's gonna summon help, but nobody ever came back. Uh, ba uh, Baker was badly wounded with three wounds uh, all of his soldiers except seven were killed, 16 dead, seven were wounded that remained. He and one other man violently attacked uh, the German positions. He knocked out four German bunkers with satchel charges and hand grenades, uh, leading them to the GIs to victory. The final German dead count was almost 100. Uh, that man, uh, I had a privilege of uh, interviewing him, but he told me every night when he went to bed, there's a loaded M1 Garand rifle by his bedside with a bandolier of, of, of ammunition clips and a 45 pistol. When you go into combat like that, it, you just don't turn it off. It stays with you the rest of your life. This uh, facing high civilian casualties in the final Allied offensive into Germany during January to April 1945, the U.S. Army began secretly integrating black rifle platoons into white infantry divisions. These black volunteers had to surrender their stripes and served in 5th platoon of K Company, 394th Regiment, 99th Division. That's some of those men, that's after the war, but you can see all the, you can't see all those men have combat infantrymen, infantrymen's badges, every one of them. Our first black generals, Brigadier General Benjamin O. Davis, U.S. Army, 1939. His son, uh, General, well then, Colonel B.O. Davis Jr. led the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. He became the U.S. Air Force's first black general in 1958. And uh, B.O. Davis was the fourth black graduate from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. The U.S. Navy commissioned its first black officers in 1944, the Golden 13. But again, they served aboard ships with, uh, I mean, the ships were integrated, but uh, these men served uh, primarily with or in command of other blacks. Only one black commander of white troops in World War II, that was my dear father, Captain James B. Morris, Jr., 6th U.S. Army Alamo Force. Uh, that picture on the right, was, that's Captain E.B. Lowe giving my father his second lieutenant's bars. He graduated first over 580 white men and 19 black men in Officers Candidate School at Camp Brisbane, Australia. Yes, ma'am. Oh, excuse me. June 11th, 1943. Now, I'll show you these pictures. That's, whoops, you skipped one. That's my father at the lower right by the arrow. There are two Alamo scouts there. You see those two men there? No, there are two Filipino officers right there. They're white officers and enlist and uh, sergeants to the left. You see that man, the camouflage and the cap over there? Those are loyal Japanese Nisi. These are brave Japanese Americans who volunteered for U.S. military service to fight against the Japanese in World War II. They needed those men to interpret because these, these men were tasked with going ashore before an invasion. This is, a, this is an intelligence briefing and a map reading before the invasion of Luzon. And um, like I say, the Alamo Scots are kind of like Army's Green Berets today. And their job was to go to the Japanese-held island, recon the positions, and bring back intelligence, and often kidnap Japanese officers for um, interrogation. Needless to say, they couldn't let the Japanese officers go back to their own lines, so I'll leave that to your imagination. Black women served in World War II. Of the 72,000 women trained at Fort Des Moines, Iowa during World War II, 8,000 of these women were black, including the first commissioned black female officer, Captain Charity Edna Adams. These women served with distinction during the war in every military capacity except combat. And there's uh, Captain Adams inspecting the troops there. There's a quote from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ovita Culp Hobby of Houston, Texas. She was director of the Women's Auxiliary Army Corps in 1942. 
said, you are the example of free women defending a free way of life to the exclusion of everything else until this war is won. Hope and victory, excuse me, hope and history join here. The women of the United States are saying we shall not fail freedom. In Korea, 600,000 blacks served in Korea uh, from 1950 to 1953. President Harry Truman officially desegregated the U.S. Armed Forces on July 26, 1948 by Executive Order 9981. Black and white troops fought side by side for the first time since 1782. The fierce fighting inflicted heavy casualties among UN, North Korean, and Chinese troops, much of it by the extreme weather conditions. Two black soldiers from the 24th Infantry Division were awarded the Medal of Honor for Bravery in Separate Battles, uh, Private William Thompson and Sergeant Cornelius Charlton. Vietnam. According to the Department of Defense, 300,000 black men served in the Vietnam War from 1959 to 1973. There were 24 black uh, soldiers and Marines awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, African Americans constituted only 11% of the U.S. population at the time, but black soldiers and Marines suffered 22.5% of all combat casualties. That's killed in action, wounded in action, missing in action, and POW. Black men constituted nearly 50% of Army infantry platoons after 1967. There's some other Marines and soldiers who won the Medal of Honor. That Rogers is the highest, he was a lieutenant colonel of an artillery regiment, won the Medal of Honor. Uh, Captain Riley Pitts over there. Most of these were posthumous. Most of these were posthumous. Race relations deteriorated in rear bases, particularly after the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April 1968. The racial solidarity of the front lines evaporated upon servicemen's return stateside. There. Nevertheless, several black junior officers rose to senior command after the Vietnam War. Rifle platoon first lieutenant Colonel Powell became four-star general of the Army, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, commander of Allied Forces in Kuwait, and Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. That's General Powell on the right. On the left is Daniel Chappie James, a Tuskegee Airman from World War II, became the first black four-star general in the Air Force as commander-in-chief of North American Air Defense Command. James flew the F-4 Phantom in Vietnam with Colonel Robin Olds, the two being known as Black Man and Robin. They were the terror of, <laughs> they were the terror of North Vietnamese Air Force MiGs over the demilitarized zone. Another F-4 pilot in the middle there, that's uh, Marine Colonel Frank Peterson, excuse me, became the first black general excuse me, in the Marine Corps in 1979. The first black female generals after the Vietnam War, Brigadier General Hazel Johnson Brown, Army of the United States in 1979 on your left, and Brigadier General Clara Adams Ender, Army of the United States. She was the first black general of the U.S. Army Nursing Corps in 1984. The Persian Gulf War, Iraq and Afghanistan, black servicemen distinguished themselves in, the, in Kuwait conflict to remove Iraqi forces from Kuwait. During that war, nearly 50% of all female Army personnel in the Gulf were African American. Iraq and Afghanistan, after 1992, the numbers of blacks in combat arms has declined drastically across all four service branches. At the end of the Iran and Iraq wars, we have seen some recruit increase among African American youth, particularly with the creation of the U.S. Space Force. And now this is the man who was the inspiration after the Holy Spirit. This is the man who was the inspiration for this, discuss, this presentation. Why African Americans defend the flag? Oh, wait a minute. I might have got it. There we go. That's Sergeant First Class Alvin C. Cash of Oviedo, Florida. He is our, most, our, our only Black Medal of Honor winner since the Vietnam War. I want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, President Joseph Biden uh, posthumously awarded the medal on December 16, 2021. Army Sergeant First Class Alvin C. Cash, Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 15th Infantry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division. On night patrol near Samara, Iraq, on October 8, 2005, his vehicle came under enemy small arms fire. His Bradley armored fighting vehicle st struck an uh, improvised explosive device and burst into flames. 
Despite his uniform being soaked with leaking gasoline, which later ignited, he returned to the disabled Bradley six times to rescue six injured soldiers and an Iraqi interpreter. Suffering burns on over 72% of his body, Sergeant First Class Cash refused medical evacuation until all his soldiers and the interpreter were medevaced safely. And I believe all those men lived. Sergeant First Class Cash died November 8, 2005 at Brooks Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, leaving behind a wife and three children. You know, we go about our lives every day and we like our sporting events, the Super Bowl's coming, and we like to have parties and go to work and, and, and have fun. But this is the reason that we can do that, that we can meet in this synagogue as black and white, brown, red, and yellow, and worship battle night because of the sacrifice of this man and men like him and women like him. So I want you to give a hand of respect to this man. Now, right now, we're in a, how should I put it, a little civil war of our own here in America. There are groups who say that why should African Americans defend the flag, that America is a racist country. I already talked to you about the 1619 Project and, and uh, uh, CRT. Uh, I believe that they are tools of the devil to defy this country. I'm going to read a quote to you that was given in 1918. Uh, over 100 years ago by an attorney named uh, Samuel Joseph Brown, who was uh, the first black Phi Beta Kappa at the University of Iowa in, 19, in 1896 and was a prominent uh, appellate defense lawyer. He's speaking to a group of uh, black men enlisting for the war in 1918. He said, but lest there be some among you who like other members of my race whom I have met in other communities who contend that this is not our country and that there is no reason why we Negroes should defend its flag. Permit me to recall to your mind a few facts from the history of the Negro in America, which to my mind should be sufficient to satisfy even the most skeptical individual that America is indeed our country and its most beautiful emblem, our flag. And you should thank him, the Negro soldier, that you are to have so large a part in the bringing to a successful termination this, the greatest war the world has yet known. For as your fathers went into the Civil War slaves and emerged free American citizens, so you, though you go into this war in some respects prescribed in Jim Crow, you shall emerge from it with your civil and political privileges enlarged in the same proportion that you shall have shared in the sacrifices that shall be necessary to prosecute this war to a successful termination. In conclusion then, young selected men of my race, accept this glorious opportunity to defend a flag which speaks of earlier struggles, of patriots and heroes, both black and white, but whose voice has ever been for freedom and equality of all men, regardless of their race or color. And again, that was uh, remarks by Samuel Joseph Brown to the Negro Draft Contingent at Fort Dodge, Iowa, July 21st, 1918. What I want you to take away from this session is the sacrifice, the blood that was spilled by all men and women of all races to create this nation that we are here before you today. That, you know, if I had, I, I could give you presentations on this for the next two years and still not get done with it. Native Americans, Japanese Americans, Hispanic Americans. I could tell you about Roy Benavides, uh, who won the Medal of Honor in Vietnam as a Green Beret. These men and women put everything on the line for us, and I think we're turning our backs on them. You will forgive my friends, but I think we're pissing this country down the toilet. I don't think anybody cares about it. We, we talk a lot, we spend more attention on cats and dogs. We got nine-year-old girls getting shot in their beds here in Houston. We have law enforcement officers called to help and are ambushed and killed. Just an incident just the other day, five policemen were seriously shot. Some guy, uh, was, uh, suicide by cop. Adonai and Yeshua said that in those last days that the love of many would grow cold. There'd be a great increase in lawlessness and people would turn on each other. Um, I want these young, particularly you young people, to know this, that it's going to be you who are going to have to stand up to bring this nation together. We're going to need the spirit of revival. Only by the spirit of Yeshua is this country going to be saved. It is not going to be saved by laws. It is not going to be saved by more money for police, even though they do need it. But it's going to be by the heart, the change in the heart. I don't know how many times I have been in school and heard young men talking about the first thing I'm going to do when I get out of here is buy an AR-15 or an AK. Or I'm going to buy a 45 or a 9 millimeter. I said, boys, I said, one, you don't talk about guns in public school at all. The way this, the school shootings, I don't know, that, that's the kiss of death. Two, you're going to get a gun and end up shooting yourself or somebody else. You don't know anything about these firearms except what you see on TV and on these video games. These are deadly weapons. They can go through four walls and kill somebody. They're not, you know, I, the one thing I think they ought to do 
is start firearms training in the public schools. I really do. Because uh, in safety instruction by the, the Texas Department of Public Safety and Law Enforcement, these young men are they gonna pick up the gun. Uh, there's a friend of mine who's a teacher in another school in HISD, I won't see which one. Two of her female students, their mothers are gangbangers. The mothers are gangbangers. These girls, their mothers were 15 or 16 when they gave birth, their fathers were in prison, they're gang members. We've got a culture that, it's almost like we embrace death. We have a culture of death. Uh, we don't have any idea, we, we don't respect life. We don't, we don't take care of our young people, we abort our children. Do you realize if it weren't for abortion, the, the African American community would be twice as big in America as it is today? Of the 73 million babies aborted in this country since 1973, 22.5 million were black or women of other races carrying mixed race babies. So if it weren't for that, the African American population would be twice as big today. That's economic power, that's votes, but the devil uses tools to kill people. And just like the devil uses tools with all these black on black crime. So, I hope you'll look at the sacrifice that black Americans have made in this nation since its beginning and understand that we're either going to stand together or we're going to die together. But we're going to need Yeshua to get through this. So I want every one of you to, to step out, step up, and that America's at a, at a crossing point. Um, you know, we elected who we elected. I don't believe they're particularly godly men and women, but we elected them. So the next election, you see what God puts on your heart. But it's going to be the people of God. We're seeing more and more. Uh, oppression against Christians, against all believers. A massive increase in anti-Semitism all over the country, all over the world. Uh, I was watching I-24, and that was last year. They had to close a couple of uh, synagogues in the Crown Heights section of New York. That's heavily Hasidic, Hasidic Jews. It wasn't white supremacists and neo-Nazis. These were Jewish men in body armor with rifles and pistols protecting the synagogues from black and Hispanic gang members. So it's not, you know, it, it, I think it was... Uh, our attorney general said the greatest threat to this country is white supremacy, bull. The greatest threat to this country, I'm sorry to say, is young men and women, many of them of color, who are doing all this killing and drug dealing. And it's not just, I mean, I'll take you up north, I'll show you a whole lot of white kids selling methamphetamine. It's just you don't hear about it down here. But it, it, it's a human problem, it's a human tragedy. I see these girls in these, in these schools, 14, 15, got raped by their mother's boyfriends, nobody cares. You know, they, they, these, they, they watch these semi-pornographic videos for these, these rap stars. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? You know? And it, it's like we don't care. I mean, if you, you go to some of the schools, like going to some of the ways these girls are dressed and these boys with their pants hanging below their butts, you know, it's just we have lost God. Like Solzhenitsyn said, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten about raising godly children, dressing in a godly manner. And it's not the children's fault. It's the parents' fault or lack thereof. They're the ones that do it, it's not the kids. But I'm not gonna sit up here and give a, a, a more of a sermon, but I just, I want you to take away from this, this country's worth something. This country's worth something. D despite what the politically correct say, this is still the greatest country in the world. And I'm telling you this as the great grandson of slaves. This, the fact that my family could prosper as it did, coming from very humble beginnings, is a testament to the greatness of this nation. Not that there wasn't violence. Like I said, my grandmother was almost lynched by the Ku Klux Klan here back in 1941 at an NACP conference. Well, my father was in the U.S. Army. But this country has overcome. We have overcome. We can come together. But we need to look at the heart. Don't look at skin color. Look at the heart. Where is Yeshua here? Where is Yeshua up here? Don't look at this. Look at this. So I'm... I'm wearing my grandfather, I'm wearing my grandfather's 92nd Division pin. This is a reproduction, this is the Black Buffalo for the 92nd Division. Um, they were the divisional uh, heirs of the 9th and 10th Cavalry and 24th and 25th Infantry. So I wear this for him. So thank you very much, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom, God bless you all, and God bless America.